friends, it's Cindy Silva on the Metaphysical Wisdom Platform. Thanks for tuning in. I have something a little different for you today. I reached back into the archives in 2014, where I found an episode with astrologer Pam Gregory. And I'm inspired to share this because there is a planetary transit right now happening where Pluto is entering Aquarius. And Aquarius is the sign of astrology there seems to be a lot of interest and i feel that astrology is an exceptional tool for helping us navigate what's to come and it's helpful to hear pam speak about it in such practical terms and during the conversation we talked about her book you don't really believe in astrology do you why she named it that and how astrology can reveal profound patterns in our lives. As I mentioned, this conversation was recorded in uh, 2014, the end of 2014. And towards the end of the call, Pam does speak about the current transits at that time, including broad brushstrokes for the year 2015, some very astute predictions I think you'll find interesting. And she takes a few caller questions, which is rare. Well, I do hope you enjoy this. And thanks again for your interest in supporting the conversations on this platform. And obviously, you have an interest in astrology. So thank you for that as well. Enjoy the conversation. I'm very happy to have a special guest with us today. We have world-class astrologer Pam Gregory calling in from the UK. Hi, Pam. Hi, Cindy. Lovely to be with you. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you for making yourself available today. I was really happy that this all worked out, and I, I'm really excited to introduce you to our community. Pam has been an astrologer for the past 40 years. In her early studies, she realized what an insightful tool astrology was and how it can pinpoint special abilities that make each of us unique. Pam has studied thousands of birth charts over the last 40 years and has, has studied for eight years with the Faculty of Astrological Studies in London, obtaining the most highly respected astrological qualification in the world. She achieved highest honors in Noel Tiles, master course and also set up and ran the new forest school of astrology i hope i and pronunciated that right is it no tile or no noel till he pronounces it noel till noel yeah that's till. the way he pronounces it but um but yeah fine all of that is is spot on <laughs> great and more about Pam, she's also the founding partner of Clayton Gregory Associates, which is a highly successful international training agency. Agency. She specialized since 1991 in coaching new business teams and teaching management personal personnel around the world at various arts of business persuasion. Pam has a book out called You Don't Really Believe in Astrology, Do You? And I just completed that book, and I'm happy to report it was a, a really great read. It was very deep, and it, it brought me to some realizations about my own chart that I wasn't aware of. So I'll be sharing a little bit about that as Pam talks about some details as we move forward in the interview. And while we do, I'd like to also let you know about our website. It's yournextstep.uk.com. And towards the end of the program, Pam's going to be giving us some highlights on the astrology for December with the new moon and some of the details with the Uranus-Pluto square and also some brush strokes, as she calls them, about the upcoming 2015 year ahead. So with that, Pam, I'll turn it over to you. And again, welcome to the program. We appreciate your presence, your wisdom, and your depth today. Thanks so much, Cindy. Yes, it really is, is, is lovely. I was just mentioning to Cindy that um, a lot of my videos seem to be getting their principal exposure in West Coast America. So uh, there's clearly a magnet there for me. So thank you. 
Mm, yes, mm-hmm. and you're well represented here. We have, uh, lots of callers on the line from California, and our community is a, a large percentage of Californians. So I'm guessing some of our community knows of you through your videos, and I'll share also that as I've been posting them in our newsletter, I've been receiving lots of feedback from people suggesting that I continue to do so because your videos have been very helpful. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, Pam, I'd like to have you start sharing with us uh, briefly how you got into astrology and uh, how one of my bigger questions for all of my guests is what do you see as trending in your field? Because that's something that somebody like you with the depth of experience you have and the number of people that you read for, you must be seeing some patterns or some trends. And that's what we're curious about as far as being on the leading edge of what's trending in astrology. That would be really exciting for you to to bring that through for us today. Yes, thank you. Well, to answer the first part of the question, because that's that's very simple. Um, I got into astrology originally when I was 21. I'd emigrated from England uh, to Toronto in Canada. And in the first month or so of being there, I happened to join a, a yoga class. And I discovered there was, um, there was a chap there, another of the uh, student yogis who apparently was an astrologer. So I knew absolutely nothing about the subject and asked him if he would do my chart for me and simply gave him my date, time, and place of birth, and he knew my name was Pam, and that's all the information he he had about me. And I went to see him a week later, and I still remember to this day, and this was 40 years ago now, um, that moment of sitting in his tiny flat in Toronto, and he knew everything about me. He knew about my growing up, my relationship with my my parents. Um, the dynamics of that growing up, important dates of, of events and big experiences. He knew about my work life. He knew everything. And he explained quite rightly that it was in no way a psychic or a clairvoyant skill. That's that's not what it is at all. Astrology is a language. It's a, a, a profound, mathematical, precise, symbolic, and I believe really sacred language. But it's a language that you have to learn with very specific rules. And I remember sitting in his flat and it was as if almost a chink of of light had appeared in the world and I was seen through this chink into a world of just infinite possibility. He'd opened up a, a huge dimension of another reality to me that I, I just didn't believe existed because astrology had so much insight. And that was the beginning. <laughs> and I haven't stopped in the last 40 years. I just uh, studied and learned and grown. And, um, and 40 years on, this is where I am now. But that was, that was how I originally became interested in astrology while living in Canada. And the second part of the question, how is astrology trending? That's, that's a really interesting question, Cindy, because astrology historically was very much part of everyday life. Um, it was impossible to be a doctor in the Middle Ages if you didn't understand astrology because it was used for diagnostic pur- purposes. Um, it was very much part of science. Um, it was very much part of religion. Astrology was taught at ecclesiastical colleges. And across Europe, all the monarchs would have royal astrologers who would advise them, guide them. Um, And even in the papal courts, they would have astrologers. So it was very much part of higher learning. If you went to university and studied, you'd, you'd study philosophy and geography and mathematics and literature and astrology. And it was only really, um, about 300 years ago when Newton came along. And Newton was a very clever chap, and because of Newton, we can send a rocket to the moon. But when he developed his laws of motion, and his understanding of, of gravity, um, he made it very clear that astrology was poor thinking because it couldn't operate on gravitational principles. The planets were too far away from the Earth for them to have any effect, uh, which is absolutely right. That's not how it works at all. And so at that point, astrology was cast to the sidelines, the periphery of society. It was intellectually discredited, if you like. And the, uh, you know, ironically, the so-called age of reason arrived. And it's remained in that place um, until today, pretty much. 
But I think the changes with people's increasing understanding of um, quantum physics and how the quantum world works, astrology is about to take its rightful place in society again, and people are recognizing just how incredibly insightful it is. Mm. Yeah. I noticed that when I was reading the book, I was tracking what you were sharing in depth about the Uranus-Pluto square and just recognizing how all the technological breakthroughs that have come have come when those two plants were dancing in specific angles to each other and my uh, direct relationship to that, and it was really helpful. So thank you for that research. Yes, that was, that was a huge project, going back to the 1490s on a global basis, <laughs> and um, really tracking what was happening at very precise Uranus-Pluto aspects, one of which we're, we still have at the moment, up until March um, next year. And there's some very, very clear themes that come through with Uranus-Pluto aspects. Um, one of the themes is revolution. Um, that people tend to rise up against their governments and their institutions and, and protest, and it's always to do with the need, the desire for increased freedom and equality, always. So those revolutions and rebellions have occurred through history and indeed are still occurring. The, the Uranus-Pluto aspect this time around really began with the Arab Spring, the people rising up in the Middle East. But we've seen it across many countries and even in America recently, you've had uh, disturbances of a, a similar nature. So that's one of the key themes. But another key theme is breakthrough in science and technology. Um, new discoveries and, and also discoveries that enable us to see a bigger world. I think that's a very important point, whether it was you know, Columbus discovering America or putting our first man on the moon in July 69, the Uranus-Pluto aspect had kind of broken us through to a, to a new way of seeing the world. And I think this time around, the new way of seeing the world is actually recognizing that the, the world is made up, the universe is energy and vibration. I think that's a huge paradigm shift. But there's another theme as well, which is to do with communication, because Uranus is a higher octave of Mercury, the planet of communication, and so there have been technical breakthroughs in communication at these points in history, starting with the printing press in 1450, moving through the, to the development of the electric telegraph, then the development of the internet, so there have been jumps all the way through in communication. And I think one of the manifestations of this period in history is going to be the beginning of, of people um, communicating telepathically. I think that's going to be a very high level form of communication which this new paradigm is going to bring about. So, yes, I would agree with the telepathic assessment. I've been seeing that coming through in different types of study and research in metaphysical directions about us becoming a telepathic civilization or returning to a telepathic civilization and it involves some mutations happening at the level of our DNA. One of the things in your book that you really bring right up front is the difference in the way you approach astrology to uh, the sun sign astrology and that's I think really what makes you stand out as uh, different in the direction that you take with it and the focus. So if you'd like to share about that and the significance of that, um, that would be helpful for our listeners. Yes, um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty allergic to sun sign astrology. Um, ironically, it's often where people begin to get curious about astrology, but in each birth chart, there are up to 3,000 variables. So the sun is, is a tiny part of that. Yes, it's important, but it's a very tiny part of the whole. And um, frankly, if you're a woman, the moon is more important than the sun for you. And the moon is very, very dominant in your daily behavior. It's your dominant reigning need um, in terms of what you need to make you feel happy and fulfilled in your life, contented on a daily basis. So, you know, if you have the moon in Aries, do you need to go 
climb a mountain on a regular basis to feel fulfilled and happy. If you have the moon in Pisces, you might need to meditate with a candle. If you have the moon in Cancer, you might need a herb tea in a back rub. You know, they're very, very different moods. And so the moon is more important than the sun. The other thing that's very important in the chart, given that we have so many variables in it, a very important point is what is known as the point of incarnation or the ascendant. And this is determined by um, the time of your birth because the earth keeps spinning. The earth never stops spinning. So at the moment of your birth, the constellation that is on the horizon at that moment, that is the sign of your ascendant. And that acts like a filter or a lens over your entire chart. It colors it, whatever that sign is. And I've noticed very much that whatever the sign is, it will bring up a major life issue for the person. So for instance, if you have a cancer ascendant, cancer is ruled by the moon, it's very connected to mother and motherhood. So your mother and the issue of motherhood might be a really big deal one way or the other. If it's Capricorn, that's the sign of the father. Father could be a big deal. So I've noticed um, the importance of the sign actually setting up a life theme for people. So beyond the sun, um, certainly the moon and the ascendant are, are way more important. And then we start to get into a sort of multi-dimensional um, matrix where you're looking at all the different planets, where they sit in the chart, how they aspect each other, and that gives the astrologer just an enormous amount of information to start to decode who you are and what your life experience has been and is likely to be moving forwards. So one of the difficulties I think people find with astrology um, when they begin is that it's just so much information that it takes a long time to learn how to synthesize that. So, you know, if it was as easy as sun sign astrology, it wouldn't have take, taken me 40 years to, uh, <laughs> to know how to do it. It would be way, way simpler than it actually is. But it's worth sticking with the effort because it produces just this precious complexity of each individual. And each birth chart is completely unique. And that always, it, I still get tingles down my spine every time because that unique pattern of your birth moment will never be repeated in history again. That's why you're special. That's why every one of us is special. And part of my task in, as an astrologer is to highlight all those particular gifts that make you you, that you can really bundle together to make a unique contribution to the world. Um, and so, uh, yes, a, a very long response to a short question, but it's way, way, way more than, than a sun sign. Absolutely. I noticed that when I was reading your book, and I've studied something called human design and the gene keys. And in human design, the incarnation cross is based on your sun sign. And your book suggested uh, the ascendant and so I created a whole new incarnation cross for myself and it brought up uh, completely different information and when I reviewed it it was very accurate and so it's, it's really made me take another look it feels like at a, a deeper level and um, not that the other wasn't helpful it was but I think the combination of the two has really given me a broader perspective of what's been really occurring through me rather than what uh, I and my conscious self and will has been creating. I'm understanding that there's something actually deeper working through me, and it was helpful to have the piece on the uh, the ascendant. That's, that's wonderful, Cindy. I, I'm really thrilled about that because the ascendant, um, as you well know yourself, isn't just the, the sign, it's the exact degree of the sign. And people right. often ask, you know, why is the birth time so important? Well, the answer to that is because the earth spins and the earth never stops spinning. And 
Um, at the moment of your birth, the constellation on the horizon, as I've said, sets up the horizontal axis, the ascendant and the horizontal axis, and the constellation overhead at the moment of your birth sets up the vertical axis. And those two axes are actually the most sensitive things in your entire chart. And I would go so far as to say that no major life change happens without those axes being triggered by planets moving around in their orbits today. Um, and if your birth time is off, let's say your birth time is eight minutes wrong, um, every four minutes, those axes will move approximately one degree. So if you're eight minutes wrong in your birth time, you're going to be two degrees off in those axes. And if I'm looking forwards for you to a slow-moving planet like Pluto, I could be up to three years wrong in experiences and events that I'm talking about that may occur for you. I could be three years wrong. So that's why the birth time is, is so vital to start to move forward to understand your unfolding development. Mm -hmm. You speak a lot in your book about those outer, slower moving planets and specifically how that when they transit over the ascendant, for example, or the midheaven, would you want to speak about some of that cosmic weather forecasting that you talk about in the book? Yes, I, I mean, yes, because these are, are, you know, often very, very major events. Um, Let's just talk about the, the simplest one, which is the vertical axis, and that's your career axis. So I talk a lot in the book about living strategically rather than just being the rubber hitting the road. And it's like having, as Cindy says, it's like having a, a cosmic weather forecast that is completely individual to you. Nobody else, this is individual to you. And... It's, it's just really astrologically common sense because, say, if you were planning a family picnic, you'd notice the weather forecast for the upcoming week and you'd choose a sunny day rather than a day that was going to be a heavy rainstorm because the picnic would go better on a sunny day. And it's really that simple um, when you're looking forward with your astrology. So if, for instance, you want to start a new business, or a new part of a new business, a great time to do that is when Jupiter is coming up to that career area because Jupiter is the planet of expansion, abundance, success, appreciation, applause, money. Um, that is a great time to do it as opposed to when you might be having some much more challenging aspects. If you know you have the planet Saturn, which is the taskmaster, moving up towards that high point of career, the message is very much about work hard, keep your head down, obey the rules, you know, don't, don't kick against the, the boss's orders, just be very obedient, work hard, and at the end of that period, you'll get your reward. You will get a hard-earned um, raise or a hard-earned promotion. Won't be lucky, it will be absolutely equal to what you've, uh, uh, what you've earned. Conversely, if you have the planet Uranus moving up to that career area, that's the opposite. It's the maverick. It's, it tells you to break the rules, to be original, to be creative, to have more freedom day to day and not, you know, not count out what the boss is saying. So it's very important that we know these things because if, for instance, we're having a Saturn transit to that career area and we behave as if we're having a Uranus transit, you know, we, we bunk off early and we, we don't work hard, we're quite likely to get fired because that's another expression of Uranus coming up to the, the career area, a sudden cutting off. However, if we play it well, we can start to be, perhaps become much more creative in our career area, develop more autonomy, or if we can't do it within that job, we can leave that job and um, develop another uh, career line. But it's then under our control, because the music has to play. So if we're not taking charge of the symbolism and making it work positively for us, it's going to come from the outside. It's going to hit us from the outside. Um, I think it was Jung, who was also an astrologer, by the way, Carl Gustav Jung, who said, what we are unconscious of meets us outside as fate. 
it comes in from the outside, which is much more uncomfortable. So knowing these things will really, really help you to go with the flow in that area. Equally, if we're talking about the horizontal axis, this is the relationship axis. So say you have a very big um, transit coming up. Say you have transiting Uranus coming onto that horizontal axis, that ascendant. That only happens once every 84 years, so it's a big deal. If you're not aware of that, you may find that the partner is demanding more freedom, more space, feels things are getting stale and all of it's samey, um, doesn't want to spend any, every evening with you. And if you're not aware of why that's happening, eventually he could come home and announce, you know, this, he's off, he wants total freedom. Whereas if you understand the symbolism, you can recognize that the issue is one of freedom. And in giving both of you more freedom in that relationship to be your true selves, you can refresh the whole dynamics of a long-standing marriage and it can be really wonderful because you've understood the symbolism and you're playing it to the positive. So this is such practical information. You know, it, astrology is a, a spiritual framework too, very much so, but it's, it's just so practical because it really helps you as you move through your life to understand what is trying to unfold in your development. Um, and, uh, and that's what people find incredibly useful, I think. Getting a little echo. One second. That explains how we can use astrology to live strategically. And you also speak about understanding your birth chart can increase your consciousness. How is that? Yes. Um, yes, it really can because it can make us very aware of our patterning. And our patterning is usually laid down when we're children um, due to the relationships we have with our parents and the, you know, any dramatic events we have as children. These scripts are laid down in the neural network. And so we may have a habit of repeating um, the same pattern in a negative way. I talk in the book about a client who's... Um, whose mother left the family home when this client was four years old. And the symbolism was very clearly shown at four because um, the moon is the mother and it was a Uranus transit. Uranus is cutting off from the mother. And subsequently, every single time in her life, and they aren't that frequent, but every time she had a Uranus transit to her moon, there would be situations of abandonment, people cutting off, friends cutting off, boyfriends walking away, she'd been fired, and the timing was absolutely exact in every instance. So she was living out that patterning in a very negative way. But once we were in that session, and I explained to her the symbolism of Uranus can be very positive. It's about freedom and, and originality and her taking control of that rather than always being the victim end of it. Um, she's changed her life considerably, and I could almost feel, you know, those insights crashing through her consciousness of all of those years that she'd lived out the negative side rather than the positive side. And there's, there's always a positive side to every um, planetary aspect. So I think in, it increases our consciousness because, first of all, it makes us aware of the patterning in our lives. Secondly, it very clearly makes us see that the outer events aren't just life coming at us because astrology shows that life comes from us. Because every event in people's lives, you can clearly see the symbolism in the chart. Nothing happens in someone's life without it emanating from the symbolism in their particular chart. And I often think of the birth chart like a unique sheet of music. So the music has to play, but it can play well or it can play badly. So in becoming aware that you know, these very difficult experiences that people may be going through are actually coming from us, that is incredibly empowering. It stops us being in victim mode, and it makes us realize we can take control of the potential that's unfolding for us and live it really 
positively. So incredibly empowering. And this is where people move from being victim to co-creator. And co-creator not just in a kind of general modality sense, but co-creator in a highly specific sense because it's based on their individual chart. So in, in those ways, I think it really helps to, to raise your consciousness, to, you know, to take hold of who you really are and live it to the full. Well said. Yeah, beautiful. I love that. The co-creative part was really a standout moment for me in reading your book as well. And there's just so much more in this wonderful book. If you've tuned in late, I'm Cindy Silva, host of the Divine Design Program. I'm here with Pam Gregory today. Pam has written a book called You Don't Really Believe in Astrology, Do You? And I haven't given you a chance to share with us why you named the book what you named it. I think that would be a fun direction to go now, and then we'll take a few questions from callers. Okay. Um, I just had to call it that. It, it's very interesting. I seem to have led a, led a split life over the last um, 40 years because, you know, I, I worked at, uh, at a high level in the corporate world, and um, if it ever came out that I was an astrologer, um, uh, whoever was receiving that information would tend to revert to the Newtonian paradigm and, and ask me in a very particular tone of voice whether I really believed in astrology. Um, and often that came after a period of sort of intense mathematics and study. And um, I just thought, gosh, the world really has no idea about serious astrology. And so I wanted to put the case for serious astrology, but I wanted to put it in a way that even people who weren't familiar with serious astrology or had very little knowledge could actually follow all that astrology has to offer. And that's very rich and very deep. And so that's why I wrote the book. Mm. Yes, and and speaking on that line as far as the astrology that you're bringing forward that's very rich and um, there's a quantum element to this and it goes beyond linear time, the type of information that's coming through the way you approach astrology. Let's have you speak again to that, and like I said, then we'll take some questions. Yes, what, I mean, what, this is absolutely fascinating, really, because astrology works partly on linear time in that you're studying the, the orbits of the planets in real time and seeing how they're aspecting your own birth chart. So that's one part of astrology. But the real the really powerful part of astrology is um, really looking at the concept of the microcosm equals the macrocosm. And this is very much hermetic philosophy as well. Because it was, it was actually 3,000 years ago that the ancient Babylonians discovered that if you took a day um, of planetary measurements and turned that into a year of someone's life, it was remarkably revealing. And so this was pursued over the ages that there was an error coming in, there was a slight error coming in. And the correction to the error was that the day for a year measurement has to be based on the apparent speed of the sun at the moment of your birth. Can't be, you know, your sister's or your mother's or your father's speed of the sun has to be yours, the apparent speed of the sun at the moment of your birth. And all the measurements uh, the symbolic time measurements of a day for a year are based on that, and that those are the really big bells. When I use those measurements, that's where really big life change emerges, and they are very, very reliable. So, you know, I can be very confident of asking very big questions about life change um, at various points in people's lives. I always ask them questions going back in time about their lives. And they will be the biggest changes that people go through. And that's fascinating because that's nothing to do with clock time, nothing at all. It's very much to do with an internal unfolding, an internal, internal development. And this is where I think we start to link with the quantum world, where in the quantum world there is no linear time. Linear time doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It transcends 
space and time. So there's something very deep about about astrology that is linking in with some of the key understandings in quantum theory. And that's really, really exciting, I think. That is exciting. And my experience of that quantum element in astrology ties into intuition because I've often taken action in a specific direction, not really knowing why, just having an internal feeling that there was a a need to move in that direction. And then later having support from my astrology friends and a community of people that understand astrology looking at my chart and saying that things were... uh, written in my chart that that was specifically the right timing and it's such good validation and confirmation i've really appreciated having our partner on the network samant uh, helping me along the way especially through some challenging times with my health and when i read your book about the uh, doctors used to be astrologers it was a requirement that doctors new astrology and they used it to help diagnose some of the problems i can tell you that would have been really a great deal of help for me um, in this day and age if that were true and my sense is that any doctor that um, knows and applies astrology to their work will be on the leading edge and this will be a a brand new emerging field not really new but a re-emerging out of the necessity because things that can't be explained by traditional medical models um, and can be by the influence of the cosmic alignments will start to come into our awareness and the need for that knowledge will, will again be sought out. Yes, I think that's very interesting, Cindy, because the chart... The chart is essentially a mathematical expression of your energy in great detail. And we know we are almost entirely energy and we get we get sick when we have energy blocks. And the chart will show the potential areas of body weakness and very importantly show the timing of um, when health problems may arise and the area of the body and the energy that's being blocked. So I think that's another way that astrology can obtain a renewed legitimacy, if you like, by understanding a new medical paradigm. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Well, we have a caller with a question. I want to open the line for a caller in Santa Ana. Do you have a question for Pam? Hello. Hi. Who's calling? Uh, this is Kay. Kay. Hi. Do you have a question for Pam? Yes, my um, Libra is ascendant. Can you explain um, in regards to what you're speaking of earlier about how that colors everything? Yes, Kay, did you say uh, the, the line's a bit blurred. Was it Libra ascendant? Libra. Yes. Lib- okay. Very, very important. Um, this, this is what I call other directed energy. So um, you would probably be a very incredibly kind person who's always thinking of others. And the impetus is, is, if you're okay, then I'm okay. If that makes you happy, then that makes me happy. So the responses and the decisions for you may always go via the other person, which is great, of course, for the people around you because they get their needs met perhaps more easily than you do. It's an instinctive going via the other. So because there's always a need with with Libra energy, particularly when it's on the ascendant, to keep the peace, keep the balance, keep the harmony. Don't upset the apple cart. Keep everything smooth. And and that often suppresses your own real needs and, and desires because there's such a strong desire to keep the peace. And it's a very graceful energy. You know, people are often involved in the arts and that sort of thing. It's often a love of beauty. But the relationship is incredibly important um, because of that need to be linked up with with the other. So um, depending on, you know, the other 3,000 variables in the chart, um, that Libra and Ascendant would, would be pretty strong, strongly felt, I would think, for you. Thank you. Okay, good. 
<laughs> Thanks for calling. Was that true for you? Oh, she muted herself. Oh, put their hand down. And on the other side of Libra, would that be Aries? Yeah. Okay. So yes. would that be the opposite, where they would put themselves first, or does it work that way? Um, it can do, but you know, everyone's chart has other things in. So the the Aries ascendant is brave, it's courageous, it's quite a strong solo energy, it doesn't always need social approval, although there may be, of course, other things in the chart that demand social approval. It's quite a pioneering um, energy. So, you know, commonly people want to achieve a lot in a very particular area. It's very high achieving. It's also very physical. There's a physicality about Aries. They have to be busy and physically doing in, in some way. Um, however, that expresses itself, whether it's sport or just being busy around the home, but there's a, a strong physicality. So there's a kind of impatience about it as well. And yes, very classically, you know, Aries wants to be the winner, wants to be the leader, wants to do the best, um, wants to be number one. So there is that very strong impetus. But they do tend to be the leaders of the world. They do tend to be the initiators, the self-starters. They're highly entrepreneurial in what they do. And there will be other things in the chart to balance out that very singular focus, which, which Aries Ascendant has. It's terrific for focus, I have to say. You know, if you want something done, ask an Aries Ascendant. <laughs> um, because their focus is, is laser-like. Um, and, uh, yeah, so they, they usually are high achievers in their life, that's for sure. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. that. I have uh, Samant on the line. I'd like to open her line to see if she has any comments or questions. Samant, hello. Hi. Oh, this is so feeding me. I'm so happy to um, be able to meet you. Hello, Sima. Lovely to, to speak to you. Um, I just would um, want to bring forward, um, as we've been experiencing this Pluto-Uranus square, my heart um, has been so hopeful having um, Neptune in, Plu in, in Pisces, bringing in compassion and vision that as Pluto is taking the structures into um restructuring and um, the revolutionary energy of Uranus, you know, bringing the impetus to, yes, let's make it happen, that there's beautiful Neptune holding the space of compassion and vision that as the changes come forward, we'll have those, uh, those Piscean energies also um, in play. Yes, I really, really agree with you. I mean, the Uranus Pluto, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen this your, yourself, Simi, on people's lives. It's been massive, you, you know, real, real big life change for people. Husbands walking out, being fired, you know, losing their homes. It's, it's been very, very big stuff. The upside of it is about awakening. It shakes us out of any old stale patterns, as I'm sure you know, and, and it awakens us. But yes, the much softer yin energy is, is Neptune in Pisces, which, as you absolutely say, is all about compassion and caring. It's about coming together. It's very communal. This was very strong in the 60s when we, um, you know, we had the hippie movement and living in communes. And so Neptune, particularly in Pisces, which it rules, it's a very happy place for Neptune, always asks us to see the, the higher spiritual perspective, to use our intuition, to see it from a higher point of view. And the good news is as well that Chiron, which I refer to as the mystic bridge, is also in Pisces. And that's again about shifting um, from staying in the painful situation to seeing the gift in the wound, seeing the gift in the situation which can shift us to a higher level of being. And we can look back in months to come and say, actually, that crisis of the moment was one of the best thing that, things that's ever happened to me because I've moved on a very long way in my understanding now. So I think all of that very communal, compassionate, intuitive, possibly telepathic side is really going to come to the fore much, much more, particularly after um, Uranus-Pluto square moves on after March. Now, you know, 
as I'm sure you'd agree, it, it, it is a sort of astrological tsunami. So after it's moved on, after it's moved on in April, uh, in March rather, we don't just have a, a flat, calm sea immediately. There's still a lot of turbulence as we, as we sort of understand the reckoning from all the shakeouts that people have had and the, and the countries and the institutions and the government. But eventually, I think it will settle into a much more compassionate vision. Absolutely. Yes, I just yeah. always like to bring that forward, that it's all just not um, going to be painful. We can trust that there's other planetary energies in play. It's always so beautiful to see the checks and balances that, yes, we're having a hot, hard time, uh, but there's also a, a, a blessing coming from another direction, from another aspect of planetary energies. Yeah, I think that's lovely, Samia. And also because Neptune is the quiet player in the drama. You know, it's easy to overlook that very um, peaceful, withdrawing to nature, withdrawing to meditate type of energy because the, the other energy is so upfront and, and obvious in the world. So, yes, that's a very good reminder. We, we must look at the full picture. Absolutely. Well said. Oh, thanks so much for coming um, to our um, our network. I'm just thoroughly enjoying your presentation, and I look forward to reading your book. Oh, wonderful. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Samant. Yeah, I love what Samant brought up, because um, with the, the Neptune and Pisces piece, is that we have a whole generation of beings being born with that in their chart. And you said it's a coming together and it's a quiet, peaceful kind of uh, force. And that's what I see in these, this new generation of children being born at this time is they're bringing that in, that, that Piscean, uh, psychic, sensitive, intuitive ability to connect with other dimensions, as you mentioned, with the Chiron being in that position as well. This this new generation promises to be bringing in something um, that is going to bridge us to other dimensions. Yeah, absolutely, Cynthia. You know, they are personifying the, the new paradigm, I think. You know, they are, they are being birthed with it with all of that already built into their birth charts. We've had to go through the, um, perhaps some of the Uranus-Pluto struggles to get there. They're being born with that gift already there for them. So really special, yes. Mm. And I'm also finding a little cosmic humor in the in the idea that as I read your book and I feel the energy of the square of Uranus-Pluto, that it's all about spiraling upward and that the um, initials for Uranus and Pluto spell up. So I just feel like that's another cosmic kind of wink that um, could easily go overlooked, but it it pointed itself out to me, and so whenever I'm feeling victimized by it, I can just uh, look upward. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that is the impulse that we continue to spiral upwards in our evolution. That, you know, that is the hope, that's the, that's the impulse. And that's how I, you know, encourage people to live their lives, that they're building on the previous experience of that same cycle. You know, that they're always moving forwards in their, in their experience with whether it's a Jupiter cycle or a Uranus cycle or a Neptune cycle, they're moving upwards in their evolution. Um, definitely. Um, that's, that's what everyone would wish for. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, every once in a while I have an echo, so I have to just mute uh, your line while I speak, and then I'll unmute it in a moment. I'm going to take this question from the webcast from Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Uh, her question is a good one. It, it's about the ascendant and wondering if it's the same as the rising sign. And... Uh, also wanting to know how that shows up as Virgo being the rising sign energetically. I missed the first part of the question, Cindy. Was that saying, is the sun in the same sign as the rising sign? Is the ascendant and the rising sign the same? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. They're interchangeable terms. Um, the ascendant is usually the, the very specific degree and minute of the sign, but the rising sign is just the generality of the sign, be it Cancer or Leo or Virgo or whatever. 
Mm-hmm. So the ascendant is more specific. Yeah. And she's wondering about Virgo. Yes. The a Virgo ascendant um, it can be a real perfectionist. Um, can give yourself quite a hard time because um, there's a very strong critical ability with Virgo. Um, so it's very easy to sort of beat yourself up if you're not completely 100% perfect. Um, it, it, it's got a wonderful humility, Virgo. It's, it's very keen to serve in a practical way. You know, how can I help you practically? What can I do for you? So it's, it's wonderful for, for, for helping other people. Um, it's, it's also got a very strong work ethic, but it can have this sort of what I call a worry wart aspect, can be a little bit anxious because of this perfectionist critical streak. And that worry and anxiety can hit the gut sometimes. Um, digestive issues, that sort of thing, because you always keep pushing yourself, pushing yourself. And because Virgo is all, also ruled by Mercury, um, there's a need for a lot of mental input as well. So that can create a kind of nervy itsiness, you know, being quite highly strung um, in a nervous sense because of that need for input. So it's very important to um, ground yourself, uh, you, know, you know, about earthing, being in contact with the earth, meditating, and really being kinder to yourself. I think all Virgo ascendants need to be much kinder to themselves because they are very self-critical but very kind again with other people because always wanting to help. And very very humble, very modest as a sign. Oh, thank you for that answer. Yes, because you mentioned that that was about relationship access. And so when I was wondering what you were going to say about the Virgo in terms of relationship, but you answered my question when you said, about being in relationship to yourself, being kind to yourself, because that is the first relationship. So I think that applies in all of these situations. I do have another caller. I'll open the line for Spokane, Washington, if you can give us your name and your question. Hi, my name is Judy, and um, first I wanted to say hi to Samant. She did a great uh, astrology reading for me. I appreciate that. Um, so my rising sign is in Scorpio, and I um, am just beginning to kind of understand that. I wondered if you had any insight. And then also I just wondered, I have all these personal planets in Aquarius in the third house, so I don't have a lot of Earth, but I'm having trouble just physically trying to, um, oh, you know, lose weight and just trying to be more grounded in the Earth. And I just wondered if you have any insight into that. Okay, Pam, did you hear the question? I, I missed it after uh, Judy was trying to lose weight. I missed the rest of the question, but I can certainly answer the, the first part of the question. Scorpio ascendant is is formidable. Um, a very good example of this was our, our previous Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, who I think was well known internationally, uh, known as the Iron Lady someone of enormous willpower, and that's what a Scorpio Ascendant gives you. It gives you tremendous focus, willpower, determination, tenacity, never give in, um, and drive self very hard. Um, it can set a goal and be absolutely un- unrelenting in, in the commitment to it. You know, nothing will get in the way. So it can be quite ruthless and tough on self. Um, there's a constant need for transformation with Scorpio Ascendant. It's almost like the old emotional conditioning isn't sufficient. So you've got to keep changing and growing and changing and growing. So all through life, this constant process of, of transformation. And it needs to live with a passion. It needs to live intensely. It doesn't want to live an average life or a mediocre life. It has to be with a passion and with intensity. Um, it's actually, because it's a water sign, it's actually incredibly sensitive on the inside, but that would be hard to spot from the outside because it appears so strong. And it values strength, doesn't like weakness, you know, can be incredibly kind. And with that Aquarius emphasis as well, you would be very concerned for other people and very kind, but eventually you would expect people to stand on their own two feet because you wouldn't like weakness in certainly, certainly in yourself and therefore not in other people. So there's a sort of admiration of strength here. 
But Scorpio people are usually, Scorpio ascendants, people who go a long way in their lives because they're so determined. Of course, it's very, very different from Aquarius. You know, if Scorpio is intense and focused and driven, Aquarius is kind of cool and detached and stepping back and don't show any emotion because it's needy, um, you know, never, never sort of um, reveal anything personal is almost the feeling with Aquarius. So they are in square. They are very, very different energies. And you might almost feel that, sort of hot, cold, you know, intense, detached polarity within yourself. Um, in the third house, that would give you a lot of communication ability, communication ability that was very concerned for uh, the common good, could be quite humanitarian as an impulse, you know, concerned for improving society and that kind of thing, depending on which planets um, you have there in Aquarius. But quite a complex mix that because they are at odds, Scorpio and, and Aquarius, which makes you very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your question. And thank you, Pam, for taking the time to answer these personal questions. We are coming to towards the end, so this would be a great time to start heading into the direction of sharing what you're seeing ahead for us, not only in December and the culmination of this square pattern with Uranus Pluto, but a little bit of a, as you call it, brush stroke into 2015. Are you able to hear me, Pam? Oh, I'm sorry, listeners, her line dropped off. She will be calling right back in. We're connecting her from the UK in through Skype and we had anticipated having a couple drop-offs, but um, we we're fortunate that that didn't happen until now. But I'm certain she'll be dialing back in to um, finish the conversation with those highlights for uh, 2015. So thank you for your patience. Usually it takes a second for her to return. And I'd like to acknowledge Carol for her comment on the webcast and checking in from Lincoln in England as well. And also um, a nice little hello on the webcast from Samant and Mary. And if you have any other questions, you can type them into the webcast as well. While we're waiting for Pam, let me just read a couple of the quotes that I highlighted out of her book. This, the book is called, You Don't Really Believe in Astrology, Do You? How Astrology Can Reveal Profound Patterns in Your Life. And it's an easy read. I read it easily over the weekend. And I really came into an awareness of some things that I um, probably would not have tracked myself. And it had to do with my work in the world and patterns that I've recognized. But I was able to recognize them on a deeper level in the book. And what that did for me was really help me to trust my own instincts in the direction that I've been uh, going. And uh, welcome back, Pam. Yeah, sorry, it dropped out there. Yeah, we I'm... we noticed that. That's okay. I'm glad that you were able to return and hook back in. Uh, whenever you're ready to start sharing with us about your uh, insights for the rest of this year and uh, the big overview for 2015, we'd love to hear your perspective. Okay, fantastic. Well, firstly, we've got a, a full moon coming up in Gemini on the 6th, this coming weekend, and that's happening at 4.26 a.m. Pacific. Um, if you're in the UK, it's 12.26 lunchtime. And this is in Gemini, 14.17 of Gemini. And it's very interesting because the moon in Gemini is opposing the sun, Mercury, and Venus in Sagittarius. So there's strong... Sagittarian energy um, in this full moon. Full moons are always cycles of closure and completion. So wherever this is landing in your chart, if you know the area of life that that um, is connected to, look, watch, because it will always happen. There'll be a cycle of closure or completion. In this full moon chart, also Chiron is squaring Mercury. And so that's calling for us to have a, a change of spiritual perspective. 
And what's helping us as well is um, with all this strong Sagittarian energy, which is about visions and future possibilities and future self and, you know, who can you be that's bigger than who you currently are? There's a very strong urge towards that. It's very expansive. We have a grand trine in fire. The sun in Sagittarius is trine Uranus in Aries and also trine Jupiter in Leo. So this is very inspiring next weekend to really help us in our meditations envisage a future self and the best we can be. So that's wonderful, wonderful time. Um, Jupiter then on the 8th goes retrograde right back until April next year. And it's really, Jupiter, whenever you have a planet going retrograde, that is apparently going backwards with relationship to the Earth, it asks us to go back over something. And Jupiter is about your beliefs. So the impetus is to go back over your beliefs and see if they're still valid or if they're limited in any way and you should let them go and move on to a bigger vision and a bigger belief. Then, of course, we have the winter solstice on December 21st, and just a very short time after that, a few hours after that, we have a new moon in Capricorn, zero, zero of Capricorn. New moons are always new beginnings. So again, see where that falls in your chart if you know your chart. Um, this is happening at 5.30 p.m. Pacific and U.K. time, 1.35 a.m., um, and in the UK, it's moving on to the 22nd of December, the next day. But we have five planets then in Capricorn. We have the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Pluto. So this is very strong Capricorn energy, which is about getting things done. It's setting objectives, it's being responsible, and it's putting the work in to get things done. So this is a wonderful time at the winter solstice and together with this new moon on the same day to set new intentions for the next three months. And that, of course, links very much to the full moon that we've got coming up this weekend. So set new intentions at the winter solstice. What will help us as well with that new moon is Uranus moves direct within a couple of hours of that new moon. It's been going retrograde and 21st, 22nd of December, it starts to go direct. So it surges ahead with anything that is to do with your own pure truth, that's individualistic, that's non-mainstream, that's alternative. It's really exhibiting manifestations of your personal truth. So wonderful, wonderful time to do that. Then some of the big news in December is that Saturn changes sign from Scorpio moving into Sagittarius on the um, 23rd of December and it stays there pretty much for the next three years. And people worry about Saturn. They think it's um, a bit of a hard taskmaster, and, and it can be, but Saturn is the teacher. And it's really about putting work or focus or effort onto something. Now, in your personal life, this can be your belief systems, your ethics, but also putting effort in to making real the possibility of your visions, because this is in Sagittarius. So whatever visions you're going to be having, over um, uh, the, the weeks of early December, this is now about making them real, making real those dreams. It can also encourage you to study higher consciousness subjects, how the world works, its interconnectedness. It can encourage you to do some long distance travel, but it's usually long distance travel, not just to lie on a beach, but to understand how the world works better. Oh, Pam dropped off again, unfortunately. Oh, it's so good. We'll wait for her to return. I'm really um, curious. I want to ask her about the um, – her take on Chiron is a little different than I've heard. She spoke earlier about it being, I think, a spiritual bridge. And I've heard of it always as the wounded healer. And I'm – specifically interested in it because my husband just went through his Chiron return and I'll be going through mine very soon and I'm curious how how that might show up because also for me personally um, I'm experiencing what she said happens only once every 84 years and that is that as Uranus goes direct it will be going over my ascendant so this would be an interesting and complex time with layered 
experiences as she's been describing them. Let me open the line here for Samant to um, ask you, Samant, have you ever heard of Chiron being called the spiritual bridge? Um, I think she called it the mystical bridge. Yeah, the and mystical bridge. One of the first, because um, Chiron's only been in our consciousness for just over 30 years, and one of the first people that wrote about it was Barbara Hand Clow, and she referred to it as the rainbow bridge. It's because where it's located in the solar system, it's bridging um, the planets, um, the social planets, with the generational planets. So oh, okay. um, that's why I think she's, yeah, it's a brilliant, she, um, I'm really excited about how she's, um, yeah, just bringing astrology with new terms. I I'm, I love her um, explanations. Um, anyway, you can see I'm very yeah. excited. Um, but yeah, yeah, me too. And she's back, so we'll let her go on. And I want to thank you, Samant, for stepping in. Sure. I was having... Samant speak a little bit about Chiron, and and, um, I'll ask you more about that at the end of the program, but I want you to go ahead and continue um, where you left off. Yeah, just um, in terms of how Saturn and Sagittarius could work in the world, I think it's very likely that we will have new... Saturn is about restructuring, so I think it's very likely we'll have new laws, new policies connected with um, immigration. That's a very big one in the UK at the moment, connecting to our EU constraints, our European constraints. So immigration across the world, I think, could be a big issue. Education is very Sagittarian too. Religious institutions, um, areas like racism or xenophobia, um, strong belief systems, they could come under um, new rulings in some way, new laws, new rulings. Even currency exchange, I think, could um, be up for some new regulation with Saturn in Sagittarius because it's going to be, apart from the quick ducking back in um, in 2015 from June till September, it's going to duck back briefly into um, into Scorpio to just check that we've really sorted out any any deep feelings that we're still harboring that need to be released. Um, it will remain in Sagittarius up until December 2017. So pretty much three years, a long time. So I think the important thing is also, if you know your chart, to know which area of life that um, Saturn is transiting because that's really important, too, because it stays there for two and a half to three years. So would you like me to talk a little about that, or would you like me to go on to the broad brush strokes for 2015? Yeah, let's go on to that, because you speak quite a bit about that in your book on Saturn. If people want to know more, they can look your book up and uh, read that. But I think the 2015 projection would be really helpful right now for a lot of people. Okay, so go on to 2015. Um, just very, you know, just very broad here um, that we are going to see the final exact square of Uranus to Pluto in March. It's exact on March 15th, but we really um, will continue to feel the ripples of that and the effect that that has had in the world and in our lives, I think, for quite some time, for quite some months. Um, we have some beautiful um, trines coming up from Jupiter to Uranus. We have an exact trine from the 24th of February to the 9th of March, and again from the 15th of June to the 28th of June. And these are often about um, awakenings, personal awakenings, particularly if you have anything in the mid-degrees of Aries or Leo, you would be likely to feel these trines. They're often to do with new discoveries. And there's a real feeling of exhilaration and inspiration with these. They're really lovely. They often bring lucky breaks from out of the blue. Lucky opportunities come to us. Um, Sometimes they can bring travel opportunities as well. So if you know you have any planets or or angles, sort of mid-degrees of Aries or Leo, watch for those um, those two sets of dates. Really, really lovely. Also, um, in the first week of March, we have Venus and Mars moving together and coming to conjunct Uranus in Aries, again, the middle of Aries. 
that is really, really lovely for anything romantic. And if you're lucky enough to have that falling in the fifth house of romance in your chart, um, you need to get out a lot that first week of March. <laughs> Don't stay at home. That's really, really lovely. Um, Jupiter stays in Leo. It's going retrograde, um, as you know, as, as I've mentioned. It will stay in Leo up until the 8th of August and then it will move into Virgo. And if you have any planets or angles in, in the sign into which Jupiter moves, it's very uplifting because Jupiter is the planet of expansion. It stays in each sign for about a year, so it can bring personal growth opportunities, wisdom, abundance. Um, in Virgo, it can bring a greater understanding of very small things, like a greater understanding of quantum theory in the world, greater understanding of nanotechnology, you know, tiny things. It can bring up greater understanding of digestive issues with people, Virgo rules digestion. Um, and if you have it in your, you know, in, in the prominent area of your chart, this can give you a disciplined approach to self-development as well. So that's going to be very good news for people with any Virgo emphasis from next August onwards. Saturn, as I say, also ducks back into Scorpio um, between mid-June and mid-September next year. But that's the last time it's going to be in Scorpio for another 29 or so years. So it's just really checking that you've let go of those limiting um, emotions and beliefs. And then just finally, I'll mention a couple of eclipses, but just finally, the second half of October, there's another wonderful aspect between Venus and Mars coming together with Jupiter in Virgo. So if you have anything in the mid-degrees of Virgo, you're going to have the most wonderful triple conjunction happening at that time that can be very romantic and expansive and bring some lovely opportunities into personal growth. And then just to highlight, there's some eclipses in 2015, and eclipses are like super, super big new moons and full moons. So on the 20th of March 2015, we have a solar eclipse, new moon, super big new beginning at 29, 27 of Pisces, right at the end of Pisces. And these dates with eclipses aren't literally just for that day. They can be felt for up to three months afterwards. Then we have a lunar eclipse on the 4th of April at 14.24 of Libra. That's a full moon. That's a cycle of closure. Solar eclipse new moon on the 13th of September 2015. That's at 20.10 of Virgo. And lunar eclipse full moon on the 28th of September at 4.40 of Aries. So if you know you have any planets or angles round about those degrees, within two degrees either side, you've got to be very tight um, with eclipses, two degrees either side, watch for some major new beginnings or major cycles of closure um, in that area of your life. They're, they can be really powerful eclipses. So... Um, a lot happening, and um, I really think with the, uh, the Uranus Pluto square moving on, and um, you know, as we've discussed, Neptune and Chiron staying in Pisces for many, many years to come, that is always there for us to withdraw to nature, to meditate, to listen to music, to find our inner peace. That is always there for us. For many years to come, we can tune into that. And it's a very fine perception that Neptune offers to us. It's wonderfully inspiring for creativity, for meditation. It, 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 I've known Neptune transits um, make people into artists, even in later life, because it has such a fine perception. So there's some, some wonderful support systems for us astrologically as well. And I hope that's helped. Oh, it's wonderful. Very, very helpful. Thank you, Pam. It's just extraordinary what you're doing. And what I'd like to do is invite our listeners to go to Pam's website at thenextstep.uk.com and sign up for her website newsletter. And you will get an email with all the updates on a monthly basis. And do also... Look her up on YouTube and subscribe to her videos. So what she just painted a picture of was a very broad stroke, as she mentioned, through the whole year of 2015. But if you'd like to receive the videos on a regular basis of the updates of the 
the moon cycles and the astrology connected to that, you can do so at her website. Again, it's thenextstep.uk.com. And again, go ahead and type in Pam Gregory at YouTube and subscribe to that channel. And that's where she's posting her new videos every month. So Pam, thank you so much for all that you've shared in such a short amount of time. Um, We've kept you a little bit over what we had promised, but um, I hope it was a a joy for you to meet some of our community members and feel their enthusiasm. We have still questions coming in on the webcast. We won't have time to take them all, but um, we'll definitely have you back. And um, I'd just like to give you the opportunity to, in closing, share what you're up to and how that relates to your astrology because obviously you walk your talk so you've been looking at your chart and strategically planning your next steps and if you'd like to share that with us we'd love to hear it. Oh thank you so much Cindy yes it's been a a real real joy you know it's, it's amazing to think I'm talking to this thin little screen to some delightful people thousands and thousands of miles away and really engaging and making contact that's technology is wonderful thank you Uranus um yes it's a super busy time for me I'm very heavily booked with clients for the next few months I'm also recording my book as an audio book in December and uh, hope soon after Christmas to be putting putting that out as well on Amazon, etc. Um, I'm also coming over to New York in January. I'm guest speaker at a, a conference of master astrologers and that's going to be very exciting. And I've got many, many local speaking engagements too, but I love in particular, I love these media opportunities because it puts astrology out to a bigger audience and I'm really passionate about helping people to understand what serious astrology is, that it isn't just about sun signs, that it's it's profoundly insightful, it can help you live a bigger life and make better choices. Um, and I really hope I've shared enough of that tonight to interest you in, in maybe starting to learn a little bit, a, a bit about astrology because it is a lifelong journey and you never get to the point of thinking you know everything. That It just is infinite. You go on and on and on learning. It's philosophically infinite. So um, it's been wonderful to share with you and uh, yes, media opportunities are, are top of my list for sharing. Um, so thank you so much, Cindy, for the opportunity. It's been really wonderful. Oh, for us as well. Thank you for being here. And thanks to everyone who tuned in and had an interest. And be sure to uh, stay in touch and check out Pam's book and her website and her videos and support her in getting this message to the world that we can reintegrate the wisdom of astrology into our lives on a regular and practical basis so that we can be in harmony with our gifts and get them out into the world as well. Thanks and love to all. Until next time, bye-bye.